Okay, so I propose to, to start now. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. I would like to, to welcome you uh, to this uh, plenary session. And I am uh, Ludovic Chamois. I am the chairman of this session. I'm very pleased to, to share this session and to welcome uh, Jose Paolo Moutinho de Almeida, coming from the University of Lisbon in Portugal. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with ANMOS, you, you all know Jose Paolo very well. Uh, we just discussed before we, with him, uh, and he told me that he, he was probably one of the only one that attended the, the Anmos conferences from the very beginning. And uh, so he's a very regular uh, participant in this conference. And uh, he's going to speak about uh, one of his favorite topics on, uh, on equilibrium and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and how to implement and to develop this kind of approaches. So. Um, I would like to say so first that he is well known for this application. He, he had many contributions over the years, uh, trying to develop and to implement as well. So it's very interesting what he, he does on this topic. In particular, he has a famous book with uh, Edouard Monder on this, uh, on all the works they did uh, together. And for sure, he's going to speak about uh, this topic. Uh, as looking at the title, so so we are very uh, eager to see and to listen to you, uh, Jose Paolo. Uh, I would like also to tell people that he, uh, in the recent years, he tried to, to extend this and to apply this to different uh, application. And in particular, I have in mind about model reduction and he did uh, very nice things on, on this uh, topic as well. Uh, and eventually I would like to say that, uh, yeah, Jose Paolo, I, I, I am very pleased to, to meet him uh, each time to speak about science, but not only, he's a very friendly guy. so. I hope we will be able to meet uh, together soon when we when we can. So I give you the floor, Mr. Paolo, and uh, uh, again uh, I let people ask questions in the chat uh, during the, the the video, and we will talk uh, and we you will answer this question uh, during the 20 minutes at the end of the video. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ludovic. Hello, I'm José Paulo Moitinho de Almeida from the Department of Civil Engineering at the Instituto Superior Técnico in Lisbon. It's a pleasure to participate in this virtual session of the ADMOS conference. It's a pity that we are not together, but life goes on and so I will jump straight into the presentation of my lecture entitled More Equilibrium, More Complementarity. Hopefully, by the end of this presentation, you will understand a little more what can be reached by using more equilibrium. The work I'm presenting today circles around the idea of using the numerical techniques that are based on the direct approximation of the stress and which impose strong forms of equilibrium. It's definitely a good thing to have these properties. However, what I want to emphasize in the presentation is that using these techniques together with the traditional ones, which are based on strong forms of compatibility, typically displacement-based, is even better and provides a much better information on the characteristics of the solutions that we obtain. So, all in all, complementarity is the key word that, we want to, that I want to emphasize. Regarding this presentation, I would like to thank my colleagues and friends at IST, namely João Freitas, Orlando and Carlos, my colleagues and friends all over the world, with a special mention to Edward, and my students, which also became friends, particularly Jonathan. The key point that I will address is why do we really want to have equilibrated solutions? Normally we think that I have the weak form, and from the weak form I obtain solutions, so that's more than enough. Well, the key point is that strong forms of equilibrium provide another perspective of the solution. The idea is, again, again, and again, complementarity. However, I must point out that stresses are generally important in the analysis and in certain approaches they are obtained as derivatives of the displacements. 
therefore they are poor quality than the directly approximated quantity. So there is also a question of quality of the solutions, but that's not critical. Orthogonality of the error or complementarity is more than a philosophical issue. Working pairs is the right way to know more about the solutions. In the following, I will talk about what we do to achieve equilibrated solutions, the approximations involved. And then I'll discuss what we can obtain from pairs of complementary solutions. And that is to obtain outputs, average between those solutions, and bounds of their error, which are very strict. Furthermore, the elemental contributions can be used to drive adaptive processes, leading to a mesh optimization. This will be exemplified by applications in 2 and 3D. The first step to obtain equilibrated solutions is to define the stress approximation that is in equilibrium inside the elements, that requires the derivatives of the stresses balance the body forces and we obtain that by defining the stress as the sum of a self-equilibrated part which we call sigma s and a particular solution such that which is exemplified here for the x direction the derivatives of the stresses in the self-equilibrated part are equal to zero and the derivatives of the stresses of the particular solution exactly balance the body forces the idea is that we need a basis for sigma s for the self-equilibrated part which is a solution which will vary to satisfy global equilibrium equilibrium between the elements and at the boundary and also will be adjusted so that the compatibility equations will be satisfied in a weak form that will come later but that's the basic idea the starting point is the approximation of the stresses. In the following, I will talk about the self-equilibrated solution, which is the most important one, and how we can obtain that looking at the equations in the x direction, which are marked here. Regarding the self-equilibrated stress approximations inside the elements, we start from a general approximation, which is not self-equilibrated, but very simple to understand by seeing that we have here a linear basis in the x and y coordinates. Because we have three components of the stress tensor to approximate, these leave us to with nine variables. Now, the point is, if we have such an approximation, the derivatives are not equal to zero because some of the components, in particular, we can look at the second and the ninth column of the basis, and we see that the derivatives of sigma xx with respect to x is not always equal to zero, or the derivative of sigma xy with respect to y. So that's the starting point for the stress approximation. The derivatives of a linear basis are constant, implying two constraints which reduce the nine components of the basis to seven. In this case we were combining uh, parameter 2 with parameter 9, but this can be easily generalized for higher degree polynomials to obtain explicit expressions for a transformation matrix that gives us a self-equilibrated basis from a general one. I exemplify here this transformation matrix for the case that I was considering. So we have on the left the approximation basis complete with one xy terms for each component and on the right we have the transformation matrix which is 9 by 7. So the functions depend on the seven parameters which lead to self-equilibrated stresses. In particular we can look at the second term of the self-equilibrated basis, which is marked here, which multiplies the second column of the transformation matrix, which is all zero except for the term on the second row, uh, which is one, and the term on the ninth row, which is minus one. These terms 
multiply the second and the ninth column of the approximation basis, the complete one, and the resulting product is a 3 by 7 matrix where the divergence of each column of each approximation of the stresses is equal to zero. We look in particular at the second column and at the column number six, which is the other one that also combines two components, in this case to impose equilibrium in the y direction. Instead of working with the stress approximation in the global frame, as I was previously showing, it is possible to work with approximations which are defined in a local frame, in a frame of the element, for example, using area coordinates. In the paper given in the footnote, we worked directly with general geometries. However, the important idea that I want to stress here is that for the simplest case, simplicial element, triangles and tetrahedra with a linear geometry, this leads to elemental matrices and to transformations which can be computed analytically. So, we obtain the full matrices with a formula. We don't need to do numerical integration. The practical details can be found in the reference given here. And all this work has been extended to the 3D case for Tetrahedra and the publication is in preparation. However, I will already show you some results which are based in this idea. After imposing equilibrium inside the elements, the tricky question is associated with imposing equilibrium between elements. The point is that we cannot do as we do with displacements by imposing a continuous stress field. Continuity is not equilibrium and we are over constraining the field if we try to impose continuity. The, what we must work is with the projection of the stresses of the interfaces, not with the values of the stresses. The practical solution here is to use an hybrid approach where we impose a posteriori a weak form of equilibrium. And that will raise the question, well, you keep talking about strong equilibrium and now you are again doing a weak form. The trick here is that by properly choosing the weighting functions in a broken space, what we obtain with the weak form of equilibrium in practice imposes for polynomial basis that we always use a strong form of equilibrium. The solutions that we obtain by only imposing equilibrium are generally indeterminate. In order to obtain consistent finite element solutions, we must also consider the constitutive relations and the compatibility equations, conditions. The point is that in this context, because we are strictly enforcing equilibrium, we cannot have strict compatibility. That would mean that we, are, we were obtaining the exact solution, which only happens for very special cases. So, instead of doing the weak form of equilibrium, which is what everyone is used to think about, we impose a weak form of compatibility. The point is that instead of nodal forces, we have what we call generalized strains. The projection of the strains with the basis that is self-equilibrated. These quantities can be computed either from the constitutive relation directly from the stresses or from the boundary displacements, which are the Lagrange multipliers of the inter-element continuity condition. A displacement field is never assumed inside the elements and generally the strains associated with the stresses are not integrable. That means that there is no displacement that corresponds to them. A problem with equilibrium finite elements is the existence of spurious kinematic modes which correspond to having duplicated boundary constraints. What happens when we have spurious kinematic modes is that some loadings cannot be equilibrated or in other terms the corresponding displacements do not introduce generalized strains. This is illustrated for the corner of an element where because we have a continuous stress field the 
constraint on the shear stress is imposes the tractions to have those values. It's not possible to apply zero shear force on one phase or a non-zero on the other. Similarly, for the displacements that I'm illustrating as when properly scaled, the displacements produce zero work with those shears, meaning that it looks like a rigid body mode, but it is not, hence the name of Spurious Kinematic Mode. If you are wondering what happened to complementarity, which I was repeating every two sentences in the start of the lecture, the point is that I had to make the, inter the intermission into obtaining equilibrated solutions. Once you have the equilibrated solution and assuming that you have a, let's call it normal, finite element displacement based compatible solution, so when you have a pair of complementary solutions, we can use the orthogonality of the error to obtain either a bound of the global energy error of either solution and actually the exact error of their average and a bound of the error of quantities of interest. That implies solving not one but two pairs of complementary solutions, one for the real problem into which we are looking and the other one for the adjoint or dual or virtual, whatever way you want to call it, problem associated with the quantity of interest. The key equations regarding the error bound are summarized here. The idea is that the projection of the difference between the equilibrated and the compatible stress field onto the difference between the equilibrated and compatible strain field is an upper bound of the error of either solution, so that's the two lines on the top, and is equal to twice the difference between the average solution, the average between the compatible and the equilibrated solution, and the exact solution. So we know the exact error of a certain solution, whether that's very useful is arguable, however we can use it to obtain better bounds for the error of the quantities of interest. As already mentioned, when working with quantities of interest we need to have not one pair of complementary solutions, but two pairs. Uh, here I discussed the name, a joint, dual, complementary, virtual, whatever for the action which is associated with the quantity of interest. We then have an error for that complementary solution and the products of these errors can be used as a bound. The idea of the average exploiting the exact error for the global error is that when we compute properly, carefully, the quantity of interest not from the compatible solution, not from the equilibrated solution, but from the average solution, we have an error which can be cut enough. So we have a better quality of the error bound, a smaller interval for the point. The idea that should be mentioned always is that the expression for these quantities of interest, which, is, which, is, which are defined as a function of the st various stress fields involved, requires some attention, particularly when the solutions do not satisfy Galerkin's orthogonality. Concerning mesh adaptivity, all we have to know is that the error bounds, as well as their products, can be expressed as a sum of elemental contributions. Therefore, we use these contributions as elemental error indicators to drive an adaptive process. Where the error is large, we need to refine the mesh more. Where the error is small, we don't need to refine, or actually it may happen, we may want to increase the size of the elements. With this, without any indication about the characteristics of solutions, we identify the zones of the domain that need to be refined. This is exemplified for 
two elasticity problems with parametric values for the material properties. The steps involved are simply to obtain complementary PGD solutions for the problems involved, from these solutions to obtain PGD expressions for the outputs and for their error bounds, that basic step we will be looking in more detail, and then from these expressions we implement an adaptive process driven by the global or by the local error. The applications are 2D and 3D, very simple, all of them. We should also point out that the error bound is no longer a scale, it's a function of the material properties. It is expressed in a separate form as a function of these parameters. The error in the, for all PGD solutions is now the integral of the bound in the parametric space and is computed independently in space, in the finite elements, and in each parameter using the P algebraic PGD toolbox. The 2D example that is presented is the square plated here with two sliding supports and then a horizontal load at the right side where we changed parametrically the Young modulus and the Poisson's ratio of both materials. Uh, from the obvious quantities of interest listed, we will look at the value of the horizontal reaction at the left support, the average vertical displacement at the top, and the moment about the center of the left support. Using approximations that are quadratic for the compatible displacements and linear for the equilibrated stresses, I will show that we always obtain strict bounds of the outputs, even with when very coarse finite element meshes are considered, or only a few PGD modes. For the horizontal reaction at the left support, we always have the exact solution. That happens because we have global equilibrium, or what is equivalent, because the solution for the imposed displacement at the support is exact, so that the epsilon bar, the error of the dual joint virtual solution, is zero, and the bound is zero, even when the tractions are not exact. To illustrate the average displacement at the top, I have here the deformed shape of the plate in the case where the material is stiffer at the bottom, and we see that there are two sources for the vertical displacement. One is Poisson's effect, the other is bending of the plate. The standard variation of the ease with fixed values of Poisson ratio is illustrated in this figure, where the values of Young moduli are in the horizontal axis, the output is plotted in orange, and the bounds in green. It is interesting to observe what happens when in the simplest mesh with four elements we change the number of modes in the PGD solution. We control that by changing the tolerance and we see that the outputs are within the bounds. The first value should be zero, the second row should be minus four, and the other two values are not exactly obtained. What happens is that as we increase the number of modes from 10 to 40 and then to 100, we obtain bounds which are very strict. Zero is practically zero, the so 3.999 is minus four, and the other values are quite similar to what we had initially and the bounds haven't changed that much. That leads us to the, to the idea that when we have the exact solution, the error is in the PGD representation and it reduces accordingly, whereas in the case where the young moduli are different, uh, the error is mostly in the finite element approximation. When we change only the Poisson's ratio, we have the exact solution and for the values in the table, the output should be 0, minus 0.2 and minus 0.4.
we don't obtain immediately the exact values, but we obtain bounds which are exactly respected because the PGD solution in these placements is not directly represented. So we must include some PGD modes before obtaining the exact solutions that we have for 10 modes here. Finally, for this 2D example, we look at the moment about the center of the left support. This output has the characteristic of being zero when young moduli are the same and changing sign depending on which uh, material is stiffer. For the mesh with four elements, the bounds are very large, but that's an indication that this mesh is not a very good one. When we increase the number of elements, the, the bounds decreases. We see that the zero converges to zero, although here there is also the problem of the PGD representation. However, the order of magnitude of the output is always captured for each mesh very quickly. I also note that this is a typical example where it doesn't make sense to work with relative errors. The effect of refinement is illustrated here by comparing the, the bound of the error on the moment when a uniform refinement is considered, a refinement oriented for the minimization of the global error and a goal-oriented refinement. The 3D example is a cube which results from the triple simplification of a cube where we have zero normal displacements corresponding to the symmetry conditions. We apply a unit normal pressure at the top face and we consider parametric solutions only for the young moduli, taking a fixed value for the Poisson's ratio. When we use the average displacement at the top as the quantity of interest, we have a self-adjoint problem where with similar results for global and goal-oriented ad adaptivity. The results are similar to those that we have for 2D. The bounds are strict but very large when we have either very few elements or very few PGD modes and provided we have enough PGD modes we recover the exact solution when it is available. Here, the element size map created by the adaptivity process is illustrated together with the resulting mesh. Clearly, the procedure captures the singularity associated with the transition between the different materials without any a priori information. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I will leave the conclusions of this online presentation for the live part. Uh, however, I close with the opening title and with this idea that by using more equilibrium we can use more complementarity and know much more detail about the solutions that we are obtaining. Thank you, uh, Jose Paolo. Thank you very much for this uh, clear Thank and you. Very, can you, yeah, can you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for this clear uh, and interesting talk, as usual. Um, so giving a, a nice overview on the capabilities and, and uh, of equilibrating the solutions and, and complementarity. That's the word you, you wanted to highlight, I see. Uh, <laughs> but I, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, so now we have time for questions, but a bit, a bit, little bit less than 20 minutes. Uh, we have a first question from Nuria. Uh, she would like also to thank you for the, the, the nice talk. And she was wondering if it's possible to apply the techniques you, you propose to obtain the uh, equilibrated stresses for non-polynomial data, loading data, uh, the small f in your talk, in your discussion. Yeah. And when you have a domain that contains curved boundaries, so depending on, depending on, on the geometry, please. Okay, uh, starting with the curved boundaries, uh, what is possible to do is to do the transform, uh, uh, transformation of coordinates. So if you want to work like in isoparametric elements, it's not 
um, isogeometric analysis. I've thought about that. I, it, it's probably possible, but it, it, it's not done. But what it's done is for polynomial tra coordinate transforms to obtain a basis, which is equilibrated inside the elements and it's practically equilibrated at the boundary at the boundaries between elements. It's not exact, but it's quite close. That is described in a paper with uh, Hugo Santos in um, finite element analysis and design. Uh, that's a work uh, that can be clearly exploited. In terms of the non-polynomial uh, loads, the problem may be with discontinuities, because if you have a load, which is whatever strange function that you have inside the domain, but throughout the whole domain, what you can do is find whatever uh, particular solution you need for that load and complement it with a polynomial self-equilibrated solution. So if you find if you find a particular solution, you can complement it with a polynomial basis. So that's one option in that case. Another thing which is not totally irrelevant, and it's not what I work, but it's also an interesting topic, is that you can use particular solutions, for example, at corners or singularities, crack tips. You can use all those solutions that, that are well known for those cases and work them uh, a la XFEM, a la XFEM. That's basically the idea. The point is making the transition from the region where the load is applied to the others so that you have strong codifusivity. That's equilibrium at the interfaces between elements. So I don't know if that covers the two topics. I think it does. No, yes. Yet. All right. Well, hopefully, hopefully, yes. Okay. So you have now a, a question from Pedro. I don't know. Pedro, if yes, the or... live part. Well, actually, yeah. I was thinking about the live. Thank you for remembering me that. Uh, well, I've said it many times, and uh, I will say it again. Complementarity. So you don't need to hear it anymore. Uh, it's like talking about a typical. This year was not typical. <laughs> These times are not typical. It's uh, I will I will say it many many times complementarity because it's something which is I don't say that you should always exploit that, that, that equilibrium solutions are the are the way to have peace on world or to finish COVID. It's not true, but it's a tool which is not properly exploited, which is not exploited in depth and which can be exploited much more and with advantages in strong advantages in many situations. That's my basic conclusion, but thank you for remembering that. Um, and there was a question about the data structure. The, 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 I'm reading it about the data structures. Well, the, the point is that the connectivity at the, um, for the equilibrium solutions is done via, you think about 2D, which is simpler. You connect the nodes, and that's what everyone knows, knows how to do. Here, you need to connect the sides. So you have to work with the sides of the elements. You need to know which are the sides of the elements. We work with a data structure specifically for that, but which works perfectly for the compatible solutions as well. Uh, it's not straightforward if you only have nodal incidences to transform into the information about the sites, but it's something which is done once and used forever. That's my idea. So it's not much worse than doing it uh, live once you have the tool to go. And actually some uh, software tools allow you to have information about the topology in terms of not vertices, but of uh, sides or faces in 3D, because that's where the connections are made. Thank you. And uh, well, but thank you. Uh, a little bit on to uh, in the case of PGD solutions. 
Okay, so for the PGD solutions, uh, what we do is to use the P algebraic PGD toolbox. So we use it, well, the, Jonathan was the student who worked on that and he didn't use it as a black box because he kept changing the, the black box. So it was a, a, a box with uh, some lights fitted inside to, to change some aspects. But um, the, the idea is that you build the system for both uh, the compatible and for the equilibrated solution in a separated form. And when, once you have written that in a separated form, you just solve with the PGD because you solve for each data point, you combine, you combine the, the solutions that you have and you obtain, you do the greedy scheme of the PGD to obtain each mode se sequentially. So it's not different for the PGD, the compatible from the equilibrated. Actually, it's the same function which is called and what must be done is to set up a system which is different because you work directly with the hybrid system where you have the compatible, uh, sorry, the constitutive relation plus the boundary equilibrium and the effect of the boundary displacements in the compatibility conditions. So you have the, a system which is which has a different form, but in the end it's solved basically in the same way. And uh, the point for the for the strong form, when it is properly solved, we obtain strong forms. And actually, there is one example: is applying compression. When we do the PGD, we get a certain number of modes, and from those modes. Uh, we combine them. So those modes define the parameters, the stress parameters, the parameters defining the stress inside each element as a combination uh, of the PGD modes, and then they define the variation inside the element. Those stresses are strictly equilibrated inside the elements when they are directly obtained from the PGD. In some situations, we tried applying a compression strictly on the PGD solution. And when you apply that compression, because the compression is not looking at the constraints between elements, it's only looking at the approximations inside the elements, they are not strictly equilibrated, but the defects are very, very small. Okay, do you need to post pros? No, no, we don't need, we solve two, two independent problems. That's also a philosophical issue. You can recover, and actually that's something which is very funny for me, is that I, I think about recovering the, recovering the other way around. You can start from the compatible solutions and recovering equilibrium, but you can also start from equilibrium solutions and recovering um, compatible solutions. In general, it's not a good idea, but I'm convinced that for, um, sorry, Kirchhoff plates for bending, bending uh, thin plates in bending, it might be useful because the, the bending plates, the compatible solutions for bending plates are not very interesting and uh, are complicated, tend to be complicated. That's a nice way to put it. Whereas the equilibrated are very simple. So you don't need to, to post process. You solve two independent systems one giving full compatibility, the other one giving full equilibrium. Uh, well, does there exist an equivalent? The point is you start from two state equations, equilibrium and compatibility. If you think about its conduction, for example, you have the if flow and the temperature. So you can work the problem defined in both cases. That's the simplest case and normally when people look at the, um, oops, sorry, when people look at the um, equilibrated solutions, normally the simplest case is to work with Poisson's equation, for example, but so it's typically a potential problem. And there, the equivalent of the stresses are the, is, is the if flow, for example. I don't know. For other equations, it should be possible. The basic idea, that makes all this work, but 
probably doesn't need to work always is to have a constitutive relation which is positive definite that's the the main point or at least or at least locally is positive definite but clearly i'm working here only with the linear clays with the simplest one and i'm a uh, I have the strong idea that you should know how to solve the simple problems in a certain way because trying to solve the complicated ones. That's my philosophy in general. Thanks. Thank I you. Thank you. Know. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Talking too much? <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Yeah, well, That's yeah, my job now. <laughs> I, 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 I have one question for you. Curiosity yes, question. Uh, so when, when you have compatibility uh, solutions, you, ca you can uh, enrich this solution. I speak about. I, I think about XFEM, for instance, or MSFEM in the multi-scale context. Do you have the same kind of uh, ideas in your case? Can could, could you try to enrich well, to, to well, improve? Well, you, you can. You can enrich. Example for a point load. You can enrich with a particular solution for that case. What happens is that. At the boundary of the element, generally, the solutions will not be polynomial. So when you put an element adjacent to it, at a certain point, you have to drop that solution or keep it throughout. That's what I was saying to Nuria, that you, if you have a global solution, it's not a major issue, uh, assuming that you can force the condition on the boundary. because. The point is that you don't want to force too many conditions because then the, you have an overconstrained problem, and that's really an issue. Uh, it won't work. But, 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 but did, did you work with some? You can add information in terms of using special solutions. Yeah, and that will generally work. It may eventually lead to a loss of equilibrium at points. In regions or the interfaces typically thank you and and also do, do you have some contact with uh, commercial codes or software to implement mm. this kind of approach? oh well uh, they'll, they'll you know equilibrium elements were developed uh, in the 60s in liege professor freud voibeke and and he was a founder of uh, oh gosh <laughs> a software company which is now extinct, uh, which has now been sold. Uh, someone knows in the audience for sure. I'm uh, uh, some Seth. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, and uh, he, he, he worked in the form. And apparently, some Seth for a long time had some code to do equilibrium formulations. I never tried it. Actually, must admit. Uh, but as far as I know, Edward has some work uh, in terms of uh, consulting, but no commercial code. My codes, well, it, they are not as updated as they should, but I would recommend anyone interested to get in touch and I will get in touch and I will help whatever it is. But anyway, there is a GitLab site mm -hmm. where I have the codes I use in the book. Actually, it's a revision. But they are not uh, updated frequently. That's a f I'm a I'm a bad salesman, definitely. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, and maybe a, a last question: uh, What in your in your mind? What are the next challenges for this kind of uh, equilibrated solutions? What what would be the research well, challenges? Actually, uh, in the book we talk in a very simplified way. Well, other than these small things which are being done, which is the generalization, actually the application and showing that it works for the PGD problem was a satisfying result. Uh, and the, then there is one point is that the bounds that we are obtain are strict and they are not huge. They are limited because you always have the square root involved, so it won't go to zero. Because if you want to have a bound which is going to zero, you are fooling someone. Because the, the, the point is, you can have, I can have a bound which is zero. If I make a very good solution from side A, and I look at, at the error at side B, and then the error is practically zero. But I think that is not fair. We should have solutions which are compatible, and then try to obtain the best from both of them. 
but in terms of challenge, so other than working with things like that, which is, well, and writing everything, which is a major issue, uh, I would like to think about doing non no, uh, so geometrically nonlinearity, include that in terms of uh, just without considering explicitly displacements inside the element, just from the information that you have on the boundaries, working with the geometric nonlinearities. If you want, that would be something which is, I would say, if you ask me 10 years ago, I would say it's not possible to do in uh, with equilibrium elements or at least directly. And uh, now it's perhaps it's not that far away. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you Paolo. very much, and thank everyone for your attention. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's time to for complain Oliver about to, the to videos, thank you. but it's not it's not the time, not the right the, time. <laughs> the, the nice discussion, may, maybe just uh, before closing this session, uh, to let you know again that we have a, a small break and that the next session starts at uh, two thirty, so in fifteen minutes. Thank you again, Jose Paolo. And now okay, thank you very much. And thank the organizers as well. It was yeah. a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.